We have been inviting many people out there to, to tweet or to go on Weibo and uh, join the discussion here. And on Weibo, we've actually had 280,000 tweets or Weibos, or whatever they're called. Um, but that kind of level of intervention, and I want to just show you the kind of things for this uh, session which we've been receiving. Uh, we haven't ruled out a lot of stuff, but we can't read 280,000 tweets or Weibo postings to you. Uh, this is the kind of thing. Uh, the internet is such a brilliant tool, but it brings all the flaws and failings of humanity into sharper than comfortable focus. Technology is changing lives, but unevenly due to the digital divide affecting the poorest of the poor. How do we change this? Notice there the hashtag WEF. So if you want to um, send us uh, a message as well, try, because uh, Matthew, uh, Matthias sitting down at the front is going to be... Um, uh, he's going to be working on uh, whatever you receive and helping me to try and uh, filter them. And, and the finally, uh, at Davos, technology has helped me improve communication skills which impacted my job and life. So I will come to questions from you or interventions from you, but you can also intervene in 140 characters uh, up there if you're able to get through, and Matthias will, will handle that. Now, we have six uh, leading figures from uh, the business of the new frontiers of technology, and I'm not going to introduce them all, six of them at this moment. I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves uh, with... Literally, I've given them 90 seconds to explain what they do, what the frontier is that they're working on, and where it's going. Uh, science in 90 seconds. That's, what I'm, that's the challenge uh, I'm giving. Matthew Prince, Chief Executive Office, Officer of Cloudflare. Welcome, and um, the floor is yours for a minute and a half. Thank you. Um, my name is Matthew Prince. I'm here from San Francisco in the United States. Uh, Cloudflare is a company that does a very simple thing. We make the internet faster and we protect it from bad guys. Uh, we launched the public only a year ago and in that short amount of time hundreds of thousands of websites have signed up to be twice as fast and protected from a wide range of threats. In fact, we save so much time that and so many people pass through our network, literally over 350 million people every single month uh, that we save 50 lives worth of time that would have been otherwise spent waiting for websites to load. We, at the same time, one of the big challenges if you're an internet uh, commerce site is that you're under increasing attack by hackers and spammers and people who are trying to knock your site offline. And so Cloudflare is trying to take the tools that were previously reserved for only the internet giants, only the largest sites out there, and make them available for anyone online. And we do that by offering the service that is extremely easy to, to uh, provision and configure, but also more affordable. In fact, most of our users don't pay us a dime and the system, we use those users in order to make the system faster and smarter for other people who are on it. So we were one of the 2012 technology pioneers, really honored to be here and, and uh, great to talk about technology. So that's the background of uh, why um, Matthew's here. Let's move on with Vivek Kundra, fellow at Harvard. Uh, let me just say, because you won't say it, that uh, you named one of the top 25 CTOs in the US. Uh, uh, and Information Week uh, has uh, credited you uh, for work to drive transparency, engage citizens, and lower cost of government operations in 2009. What are you working on sure. in this new frontier? So recently I was uh, President Obama's Chief Information Officer, and through that work, what I'm doing now at Harvard is uh, looking at uh, disruptive technologies, uh, especially network effects, and how they're going to fundamentally change the way and shift power to people. So what does this mean in terms of toppling governments and regimes? What does this mean for industries like the media and fundamentally uh, companies that are going to become extinct? And more importantly, the next generation billion dollar companies that are going to be built as a result of these disruptions in the market? Uh, just how much of your, uh, how are you working on it? I mean, when you say that's the concept, but what about the, how you're taking it forward quickly, if you can, Vivek? So part of it is engaging through forums uh, like this one, uh, and also uh, working with the European Union and the United States government uh, to figure out how they're prepared uh, to actually embrace these disruptions. And do they understand these disruptions at the moment? Do they even appreciate they're there? They understand them unevenly. Okay. 
Thank you. We'll come back to that. Harrison Dillon, uh, the floor is yours, President and Chief Technology Officer of Solazyme from the U.S. Uh, thank you. I, I'm uh, Harrison Dillon uh, from Solazyme. We are based in San Francisco, California. Uh, we are a biotechnology company that manufactures crude oil through a renewable process. Uh, so the way that it works is, is depicted on the, on the slide. Uh, we take any type of plant material, sugar cane, wood chips, grass clippings from a golf course, we take that biomass and we feed it to algae and the algae rapidly convert it directly into crude oil. And what we can do that is really a, a, a unique capability, this has never been done before in the history of the use of oil, is we can actually design the oil molecules. So any oil is a, a heterogeneous collection of molecules. Uh, you take it from its natural source and you accommodate the worst parts of it. We make specifically designed oils for diesel fuel, plastics, polyester, high nutrition edible oils, even cosmetics. Uh, and as a result, our technology allows us to uh, renewably manufacture virtually any product in, in society that's made from oil uh, with a far reduced carbon footprint than what you would get if it was manufactured uh, from petroleum. And today uh, we're driving uh, U.S. Navy ships on this fuel. Uh, we're selling products in Sephora uh, made from this technology. You can buy the oils in the supermarket in the United States. Uh, and we're also making bars of soap uh, out of this technology. So literally anything made from oil we can make renewably using the technology. Harrison, great, thanks. Uh, Tiger Tiarajagan, thank got you. It, you got it right. I couldn't call you <laughs> Tiger, um, which I'm allowed to do. Uh, President and Chief Executive Officer of Genpact, based in India. Uh, we are a company that uh, provides uh, global business process management and technology services for large global corporations. Uh, started off as a subsidiary of GE, now an independent company. Uh, and we deliver these services from 17 countries, 50 locations. The value proposition we have is very simple. Very few people teach process as a science. It's not taught in universities. It's not taught in organizations. We've built over the last 13 years, using our heritage of Lean and Six Sigma, a whole science around processes at enterprise levels. And we then use that to deploy them for our customers and clients and run processes for them to drive better outcomes from those processes. The other thing that we do is we take data, which we all know is plenty in organizations, and then troll through them and build intelligence and insights for our clients. We call that smart decision services. And really both those are the way we drive value for our clients. Now Nathan Wolf, thank you, uh, Tiger. Nathan Wolf, uh, you are Chief Executive Officer and Founder for Global Viral Forecasting from the US. Yes, and what we do is we develop solutions for primary human problems by interrogating the unseen world of microbes. So here in this slide you see uh, a virus. This is actually, believe it or not, the most common form of life on our planet. If you think about your bodies, you think of them as primarily human. Uh, only about 10% of the cells in your body belong to you as a human. The other 90% of them are actually microbial. And over 99% of the genetic information of your body is microbial, and yet we're only starting to see the technologies available to really allow us to explore solutions in this space. Uh, some of the low-hanging fruit that we've focused on over the last five to ten years has been pandemics. As we're increasingly hyper-connected as a planet, we're going to see more and more pandemics emerge. Historically, the approaches to addressing these have been largely ineffective. Uh, they've been following and monitoring individuals. What we do is we target the points at which viruses enter into human populations and spread, and we're not afraid of using any sort of technology. We have a team that's basically focused of software engineers who are pulling together hundreds of thousands of data feeds in order to basically determine through natural language processing uh, outbreaks and open source intelligence and other systems all throughout the world. Um, among the sort of objectives that we have is if you think about the internet as the global nervous system, we really have a question out there, which is what would the global immune system look like? What's the next generation of the way that we're really going to tackle some of these nasty microbes? And also, on the other hand, how are we going to exploit things that are beneficial? Thanks, Nathan. And finally, Jennifer uh, Carrero, who's um, co-founder and executive director of uh, Taking IT, Taking It Global. Thank you for all being here. Uh, what we do is we empower young people 
to understand and act on the world's greatest challenges. And what we do can be described in our theory of change, which is up on the screen. Um, we're trying to help prepare educators to be able to inspire and develop the skills among their students uh, to be prepared to engage in this globally connected world. Our education system is really out of date. We provide training and virtual classroom platforms. We also have an online community, a peer-to-peer -peer community for youth. It's in 13 languages, and we have members from all around the world that are working on collaborative projects. Uh, we run e-courses to help support young leaders in lifting their ideas off the ground through creating solutions. And we work, um, over the past decade, we've worked with over 10 UN agencies to help young people have a voice in policy processes at the local, national, and international level. And finally, um, in, our, in the last quadrant, we're reflecting on the role of youth in society, and I just was recently appointed as adjunct professor in the Faculty of Health at York University, and we're trying to conduct more studies and, and more research on the role of youth and how we can leverage the power of technology um, to really engage all aspects of society. And in my hat as a young global leader, as an active member of that community, we've also launched the Youth Effect, which is a toolkit for decision makers on engaging with youth. Jennifer, thanks. Um, so we've got three issues we want to try and address in the next 50 minutes about the social impact of the proliferation of technology, and that comes through from some of the tweets. Secondly, the unintended consequences. And thirdly, what you've uh, identified here in the last few days, and what else maybe we've missed, which we should have been thinking about. Let me ask you first, and we had one, um, one message via Weibo from the Asia Pacific Institute for Broadcasting Development, the AIBD. Will technology innovations bridge the digital divide so that all people can benefit? How can we make the most of power of digital media to transform lives and societies for good? Um, let's bear that in mind as we, we look at the, the first issue about the impact of ubiquitous um, and fast-changing technology on society, those consequences, and how fast much of what you've just described to us is actually going to be felt by society. Matthew. The, the last 10 years um, was about creating the first generation of information technology uh, that really made information available to a significant part of the world. But it was, it was, it was very expensive to you know, start a Yahoo or a Google or something that was, that was doing that. I, th I think the opportunity of the next um, 10 years and one of the things that I really saw coming out in the conference is that increasingly that technology is becoming more affordable and more accessible. And so I'm really optimistic that uh, as it becomes more affordable to have the resources that you previously needed to be a giant to have, that that actually is helpful for um, bridging the, the digital divide and making the world more accessible uh, and information more accessible. It's the same question to all of you, so please just jump in or if you want to disagree or something, let's pick up with a lot of traction. But what about the time scale? I'm just interested, you said 10 years. 10 years is now a long time in terms of uh, expectations and the way timelines are being so foreshortened. But I, th I think the reason that that's a, the reason 10 years feels like an eternity now is because how quickly technology is percolating downward. Um, you, you, I, I, the last time I was in China was in 2008, and to feel the difference in just three years in this country um, is, is remarkable. And, and so I think that that's actually evidence that technology is helping drive forward um, our, our conception of time itself and changing the way that that works. Tiger. You know, 10 years in the context of a billion people and impacting a billion people, I think, is not too long. Uh, when you think about countries like India and China, and if you want to uplift people in rural areas who are not very well connected, and 10 years back, to get a landline in India used to take 25 years. Today, if you go into any rural area, anywhere, people have either their own mobile phones, or they have a mobile phone in the village where the village congregates and makes calls. What does that do? It allows you to transfer money directly to individuals, cutting out everyone in the middle. And that's a huge, uh, that's a huge problem when you have middlemen that transfers money that, that the government is trying to give the individual. So, you're, so you can run social programs at a very micro-individual level, very dramatically differently, once that technology penetrates, which it is. Nathan. Well, uh, I think Sorry. that this is really sort of an incredibly profound moment. Um, we do a lot of work in some of the most rural regions of the world where pandemics emerge. And so, for example, one of these sites we work in in Democratic Republic of Congo, you can't get there during most of the year by anything other than a plane. 
uh, and it's a place where there's uh, no regular source of electricity, and yet people have cell phones and their cell towers. Uh, at night, you'll be walking down sort of the, r the roads that are lit up by little oil lamps, and people will be selling um, energy off of a generator so people can charge their cell phones. Now, these are ju not just sort of uh, active ways of communicating. These devices that all of us carry around in our, pro in our, po in our pockets are sending off huge amounts of data about us, data that we can mine and understand to get a whole range of different features. For example, one of the things we're trying to do is to figure out if there is information that sort of can be passively acquired that tells us about illness. So our biggest limitation is right now we look out into this audience. I don't know who has a fever in this audience. Who we has a fever in this audience? <laughs> <laughs> can we have a show of hands? Anyone <laughs> feeling ill? Um, and, but Having said that, there probably is data that you're sending off, whether it's what you're searching on the internet, the called data records that come out of the uh, cell phones in your pockets that tell you where you are and how much you're moving. They could potentially give us those heat maps. And once we have those heat maps, we'll be able to transform the way that we think about illness in a way that's completely profound. And it'll be everywhere. It'll be everywhere from um, the most remote jungles in Central Africa uh, to, you know, Dalian China, for example. But can the science keep up with the data? Well, I mean, I think it is doing that. I think it's absolutely amazing what's happened. I mean, even if you, all of us see it on a moment-to-moment -moment basis, we're, we're, we're living in a world where, I mean, in a very crude way, advertising, for example, is a perfect example. I sit there on Gmail, and every message I look at it's telling me specific things that I might be interested in relation to the content in that email, the individuals who I'm linked with. You know, so I think the, the engineering is certainly possible. It's just a matter of, you know, can we get our hands on the data? I think issues that, um, that we've been dealing with uh, also as part of the YGL community, we've been thinking a lot about data sharing and how do we facilitate the sharing of information. I think that's one of the biggest challenges is humans sort of instinctually don't want to share information. And yet there's huge benefits to all individuals as well as certainly socially if we can convince people to share more and more information. Vivek. Well, I think uh, it's actually not moving fast enough. If we look at uh, the history of technology, you go back to the 1960s. Uh, the greatest technologies were being developed and deployed in most governments. Then you move uh, to the 70s and 80s. Uh, that moved to the private sector in most enterprises. Then in 2005, something fundamental happened in terms of the shift in the consumer space. So I would agree that uh, the cost of storage and processing power has led to amazing platforms and innovation that's enabled entrepreneurs to build uh, killer applications. But if we think about it as a society overall, there are far too many people who are still disconnected. They may have a cell phone, but that does, cell phone doesn't necessarily mean that it's led to their condition being improved in life. Education hasn't fundamentally improved at the pace at which technology, ha technology has. So I think as a global community, part of what we need to be able to do is to think through, you know, what are those disruptive technologies that uh, are going to fundamentally change the lives of everyday people, not necessarily by making sure they have a cell phone and we're not necessarily just collecting the data, but how does it translate into actual action? Jennifer. Okay, so when I think about drivers of innovation, I don't think of technology alone, but I think of the power of the human imagination and how what technology has done through the ability to connect uh, communities through social media and, and just through people being able to connect with one another is that our sense of possibility has been expanded. So it's tapping a different level of imagination and I think what's also critical uh, which kind of relates to your point is the need for human empathy and compassion so that the type of innovation that we're driving is for a better world. I, I you know when I, when I think of all this data and, and again I, I tend to think in terms of biotech not uh, not not internet but you know I, I see these ebbs and flows of, of, of data where you have a new technology that creates these enormous amounts of data and that we saw this with the Human Genome Project where there was this enormous push to sequence the human genome. It took, I don't know, $10 billion in 15 years and it was just brute force and brute force, but an entire industry developed around sequencing DNA and suddenly the cost of sequencing DNA dropped by orders of magnitude and now we're, we've got this enormous amount of genetic information that allows, it, and it was, it was done for human medicine, but now it allows companies like mine and many others 
to mine that data and find ways to design biological function that just simply didn't exist anymore. And I, I think you, you have the same thing, whether it's, it's social media, where you get all these people all over the world saying things, and at first you get this new technology, this new platform with a rush of information, but very quickly innovative people figure out how to do something valuable with it. Is it clear when you develop what you've, you've now described to us, what the impact, particularly the social impact, and the benefit is going to be or not? Jennifer. I think the greatest potential impact is bringing people together, but it also could be that technology divides people. So it's either community or isolation. And um, one, one driver that is important to think about are what are the values that people have in different societies when you're all part of one global community. Uh, one thing that we've come up with as the Young Global Leaders is, is to have an underlying value of global dignity. So if people interact within a global system, it's not about controlling people, but if people sort of self-regulate and interact with others uh, from the perspective of trying to increase the dignity of those that you deal with, then we have a really safe space for people to be hyper-connected. Otherwise, I think the risks are explosive. Because we are moving into intended and unintended consequences. And when we all, when we look at the text on our phones, which you've all talked about as being absolutely profound in terms of its social impact, of course it wasn't developed to do what it's now doing, yet it's become an amazing explosion. What about the intended and unintended consequences, particularly those that are unintended? How much are you thinking about that? You know, I, I think that so one of the things that I, is, that I think crystallizes a lot of what people have said is that access to information is becoming easier um, and that is proliferating. But the ability to interpret information is actually going, is because information is growing, that interpretation of information is getting, is getting harder and harder. And so my guess is what the next digital divide will be is that ability to actually process and interpret that information, either whether you have the technological resources or the educational resources to be able to do that. I think that's one kind of unintended consequence of, of generating all this data is that now we have to get better at, at interpreting it, and that's the next challenge. I think the other challenge is... Is that a processing problem? It's a, I mean, it's, it's a, again, I think it's both a technological problem in terms of just, you know, so we deal with it at Cloudflare literally billions of log lines every single day. And the computational power that we have to build in order to do that is out of reach of a lot of, a lot of organizations. And that's only going to grow and grow and grow. And that means that the people who are in front have an advantage and are able to sustain that advantage. Um, and that's, and that's, that's, a real, that's a real challenge. And I think it's going to be a challenge as we just continue to develop more data that the next step is how you then interpret that data and the people, the next digital divide is the different, it's, it's not going to be about access, it's going to be about then using that data to do something and use that in, in, in one way or another. Tiger. So there are two things happening when we deal with corporations and data to Matthew's point. One is there is a lot of data. So as a result, people are saying, how do I use this given computational powers are so high? The challenge is twofold. One, in order to really build power out of the data, you've got to find a way to build intelligence and, and, and all of that. And the second, you need to allow open source to happen. What that really means is you need to allow that data to go out into the open. That creates a whole set of unintended consequences. I mean, the fact that when you do a search on something, out pops an advertisement that exactly addresses what you're searching for is actually very scary. I love it because I can go and buy what I want, but it's very scary because it's already got captured and it captures history. What does that mean to privacy? What does that mean to security? Is a big question. It is actually preventing corporations from leveraging that to drive value to their clients and customers. Unless we solve that problem, we're actually not going to be able to really get the benefits of data and intelligence out of data. Nathan. Yeah, I, I just a counterpoint to that. Uh, we had this interesting conversation in a session on hyperconnectivity the other day, and a lot of the anxiety that we have is just very common to when there's major transitions in technology. When newspapers came out, it was seen as a huge um, breakthrough, but also a huge uh, uh, impediment to people's privacy and something that was going to be devastating. I mean, this, we're sort of experiencing a little bit of this anxiety. I think in terms of unintended consequences, uh, and some, in some ways for some of us they may be quite positive, is institutions, traditional institutions and the way they solve problems are going to be thrown on their heads. If somebody ten years ago said to you, okay, we've got this institution called the Library of Congress in the United States, and it's going to revolutionize the world, you'd look at them as if they were absolute lunatics. But effectively, that's what Google has done, is it's taken the, the 
objective of something like the Library of Congress and made information freely available to everyone, there's going to be radical different solutions. The things that we rely on historically to solve our problems, we're going to have to be open to complete and utter change. And I think, you know, ultimately it's going to be a good thing for all of us, but it's going to be very uncomfortable. And on individual levels, institutional levels, there's going to be a lot of sort of debate within government about the need for traditional infrastructure. Now, Vivek, I know you wanted to come in earlier, but I wanted to hold you on this one because I, I thought the discussion would go in this way. Because one of the tweets we've had um, is, should public sector information reuse by the private sector be encouraged by governments? And given where you've just been working and your responsibility as chief information officer, what's your answer to that? So, so my view is that uh, the public sector uh, collects a whole host of data and uh, by actually democratizing that data uh, can help generate not just jobs but breakthroughs in entire sectors of the broader economy. Just think about certain sectors like healthcare. There's very, very little uh, transparency when it comes to the healthcare sector. And a big part of it is because organizations want to preserve the status quo. Therefore, you don't have as much liquidity in the market or competition. But at the same time, you know, you have to be very careful about what I call the mosaic effect. As this information gets released, all of a sudden, whether it's the government or the private sector, can begin to collect information or create mosaics that were totally unintended. One of the things that we struggled with and worked very, very hard around healthcare was that if you could release data at a state level um, when it comes to certain operations, knee replacements, um, but if you release it at the zip code level, all of a sudden you may be in a rural part of the country and you could begin to identify individuals who had that specific operation or condition. Um, and that becomes problematic, but like any technology or shift, uh, there are always two phases of technology. And we've got to make sure that uh, we're actually balancing the opportunity with the risk that's posed. But uh, I'm a big believer that uh, democratizing data and allowing third parties to innovate on top of that is going to be one of the ways we're actually going to be able to scale and solve some of these global problems that we're talking about. You're saying that on a public platform here in, in China, but what about the resistance you felt from the bureaucracy about that principle when you were in, in, in Washington? Well, there's absolutely resistance. I mean, I remember, um, you know, not, not even just uh, within uh, when I was working at the White House, but also in D.C. government where we were releasing data around um, murders and homicides and so forth. And uh, the, whether it was the police chief or uh, the schools, where people didn't want to release data because it would reflect on their performance. But we've got to be able to end a culture of faceless accountability and to make sure that uh, taxpayers who paid for these services have a right to know where their money is going and how uh, government is actually working for them. Nathan and Tiger, given what you've just said, I'll come to you in a moment, Jennifer. Is that the kind of direction in which you, should, you believe we should be moving? Absolutely. I, th I, I think, sort of, if anything, we need to be prepared for the data deluge. You know, we are going to be in a situation where we're going to have so much data, just to refer to genetic technologies. So, one of these questions is when we think about data and we think about information, you know, largely we'll think about uh, linguistic information that's out there. For really progressive, perhaps we'll think about uh, code as kind of an information. Most of the information on this planet is genetic information and biological entities and right now the sequencing of that information is increasingly becoming a commodity. It's going to be something that's really simple and cheap and easy. In the, like in five or ten years we're all going to be producing a tremendous amount of genetic data. It's going to tell us uh, everything from sort of what exactly is causing us to be ill in terms of a GI illness to where our wine comes from, what region it comes from. There's going to be massive, incredible amounts of data and we need to prepare the sort of infrastructures that are going to deal with this. I mean, we can sort of focus on a little bit of fear we have about some privacy issues, but at the end of the day, the world is transforming radically, and I think we should just go with that. I mean, there's no question that we have to break through the barrier. How many of us can go back in the more developed parts of the world when credit bureaus didn't exist? Uh, by the way, credit bureaus don't exist in the emerging economies in many cases. It makes a huge difference when you syndicate data, and then you protect privacy or whatever, but you still syndicate data and then use it to spread credit across the board. Now one can argue that that's part of the beginning of a big problem that happened much later, but the reality is that that syndication of data has to be done. The first you know, step in that game is to recognize that there is a barrier you've got to break through. 
Uh, so you've got to talk about that barrier. Can I get to Jennifer first? Uh, just a reflection on data. Uh, what I think is so interesting is how it connects with our identity and our sense of identity. And especially now if you think about, you know, from the age of birth, you have so much data that can be collected about you as you grow up through this stage, forming your sense of self, your sense of place in the world. And our identity is no longer tied to where we live or religion or um, our culture necessarily. We're globally connected. And we have these sort of digital profiles with us as we, as we grow up. And so the question is, um, how do you deal with the potential identity crisis that one might go through? Because you may be defined by how other see you with your digital data uh, rather than how you see yourself so that that's something that I think about I will does anyone want to come in with a microphone I have a couple of tweets which I'm going to read out in a moment do put up your hand and a microphone will come to you Vivek yeah so well, one of the things to think about well, where does this end right in terms of uh, as you release this data you democratize it think well, about what this could mean for the global economy and regulations all of a sudden you could start looking at algorithms that would actually adjust on a real-time basis uh, and shift uh, the regulatory regime based on what's going on. Right now our entire institutions, when we talk about governance, are very static mm. and they operate in terms of years rather than on a real-time basis. It just, but I mean, is there sort of, if anyone's feeling slightly uncomfortable in the audience, I don't blame you. Um, but you why know, do you think they would be uncomfortable? Well, they're, everyone is going to have a different level of sensitivity to the release of your private information. And, and, the, and one of the challenges is going to be that if you are more willing to release your private information, you're going to have cheaper credit you're going to have access to more information, you're going to have a lot of things that are, are, that there are going to be certain segments of society that are going to rapidly embrace that. And it might actually be uh, Pareto optimal for people to, to actually embrace that. But I think that it's important for us to step back and realize that not everyone is going to be comfortable at the same rate. And so as a, as a society, we have to think through what are the real steps at which we can start to democratize this information without you know, getting to the point that people get concerned and you have regulatory regimes that get put in place that, are, that are just don't make sense. So right now we deal with something like the European uh, privacy laws in terms of placing cookies in browsers and, and things like that. There are a lot of great reasons why that makes sense uh, for, you know, for um, security reasons and for the ability to, to provide internet services. The law is written in a way that makes it very difficult for businesses, even governments, to comply with it. And so, you know, we have to make sure that as technology marches forward, we are still keeping in, tr in touch with what the, the people on the street really care about and not getting too far ahead of that. Well, people in, in, on the street, particularly now, care about work, jobs, whatever you want to, however you want to describe it. Uh, here's a, a tweet from Lily Lapena in the room. How can we use technology to make education more relevant and increase employment? or the use of skills or whichever um, description you want to use for at least being occupied in a way of, uh, to earn money. Any of you, please. Oh, you know, how, the, how can we use technology? I mean, the, it's, it's actually happening today. The fact that you can actually, for example, do customer service calls sitting at home uh, with distributed workforce, distributed algorithms, distributed everything, you can work for three hours on one day and nine hours on another day. You get work based on the quality you deliver, all of which is algorithm based, I think is a huge opportunity as an example. Distribution of e-learning and content into rural areas using broadband that is not proliferating is another massive opportunity. It's going to sweep, sweep particularly the emerging parts of the world. And reskilling people in economies where unemployment rates are now 9% and seem to be very stubborn at 9%. Jennifer. A huge part of it is for those who are curious and who have access, they can develop those skills and access content through so many different mediums, but it also can create a sense of capability and a mindset for entrepreneurship. So you're able to have a space to connect with others, to create solutions um, to problems and to be able to promote yourself. And um, I think that part of it also though depends not just on access to technology, but a culture and a mindset of capability and the development of, of skills and communities that allow you to respond to the challenges that you see. Yeah, and I, l let me add to that, you, you know, particularly on reskilling, you know, we're seeing entire industries that are changing at a pace that they haven't changed before. 
and, and, and you have entire populations of people who simply they just can't do what they were trained yeah. to do. The days of working for the same company for 30 years uh, are, are over, but at the same time, the money it takes the, the money it takes to go to school again, and, and you know, no, but people can't just go in midlife back to school for three years or two years. They can't afford the tuition. If you can learn these things online, you can get on something like Khan Academy or uh, you know, downloading books, uh, you name it. There's so much that people can learn through technology that actually makes them employable that just simply wasn't available in the past. And you know, a, as a rapidly growing company, one of my biggest problems is finding skilled people. It's incredibly hard. And, and if, people, if people could reskill themselves out of pharma into clean tech or you know, out of you know, newspapers into online media faster, the economy would we'd simply all be better off. Vivek, can I, I mean, given where you've just been um, uh, as uh, Chief Information Officer, what about the mindsets we're dealing with here? The kind of things you're talking about are for the next generation, many of whom are not in this hall, but the younger, the young global leaders are, of course, but the next generation who gra grip this kind of technology very quickly, but maybe don't understand where the new opportunities are. But I'm trying to get to the issue of mindsets in government and the institutions which currently exist. How out of date and out of sync are they with this new reality that you're now portraying? Well, I think um, a, a big part of uh, what's happening in government, and I've talked about uh, what I call an IT cartel, is that a lot of problems in the government historically when it comes to technology have been solved by hiring firms that do nothing more than uh, figure out how to land and expand and uh, continue to bill as many hours as possible not necessarily improve the productivity because there isn't really an economic incentive because you would work yourself out of a contract. So what's happening with this next generation um, of innovators is that they've grown up in a world where they didn't even know that the internet didn't exist or who invented it. So what we're seeing is that uh, these platforms that are created and the ability to innovate on top of them um, has unleashed this workforce that finds itself banging its head against the wall when it comes across people who are spending billions of dollars on information technology, on IT projects that actually don't work. And frankly, one of the things that we did is we made sure uh, that uh, we were very, very focused on attracting that talent and engaging them in the public sector. One of the things that the president did very, very effectively, whether it was his campaign or uh, when it came to governance, was to make sure that he was directly engaging with the youth to, to attract them to public service and to talk about how some of these innovations that are being driven. But I think it's going to take a fundamental change in terms of how the public sector actually procures technology, which has to fundamentally change rather than the old model. Nathan? I think it's also uh, uh, one of the things that I see, because I have this similar issue of how do you recruit talent and how do we cultivate sort of the next generation of talent. And I, I think one of the things I see that's really exciting is we have a number of of kids that come to our organization and they're, you know, they've done their summer working at some massive hedge fund and they have all sorts of potential and what they're saying is, look, we are going to demand a little bit more. Yes, we want huge upside and there's nothing wrong with that. We want to be a part of a successful company, but we also want something intellectually hugely satisfying and a shot at changing the world in a really profound way. And I think, you know, some of these technologies out there, and if you look at some of the most successful companies out there, they're doing all of those things. They're changing the world in a way that's really profoundly better. They're making tremendous value, and they're also doing kick-ass science. You know, at the end of the day, we, all of this data that we have, it's going to lead to these fascinating sets of questions and ways of changing things. And I think there's going to be uh, sort of a next generation of companies, um, things like that we're trying to build ourselves and in, in my company that are going to try to capture that sort of talent and say you don't have to, you can do all these things. You could be at the center of that Venn diagram where you're really nailing things. I, I, it's surprising when I find myself the Luddite on a panel, um, but it is, uh, you know, I think that we still have to recognize that a lot of the challenges that we're having right now, you know, in developed world countries, um, in terms of unemployment, 
it come from the fact that technology is displacing traditional traditional jobs and traditional roles. And what we learned through a period of economic, economic downturn was that we could cut back at, at companies and live without the people that were actually satisfying those roles. And so while there is a huge opportunity, and you know we suffer from trying to get great engineers that come to, to come to Cloudflare, and you know it's impossible to the Bay Area, it's impossible to find people to work for you, but. But the, again, the rest of the world is there is still a real threat, and this it is it is not necessarily going to be a smooth ride from point A to point B. And and the people who figure out how to make that as smooth as possible, I mean that that's 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 a very important role for for people to be really thinking through how that how technology and how education is going to make that happen. Well, I mean, I would I would say I would slightly disagree with that because I think if are you a luddite too or not? Sorry, are you a luddite or not? <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> uh, I Neither mean, my I. view is that if you, if you look at the proliferation of technology, my view is that it hasn't scaled fast enough. But where it has been applied, it has made a fundamental difference, especially in the lives of those people that have access to the least resources. If you think about India, for example. Uh, farmers, when they're farming and selling into cities, didn't really have access to how commodities were priced. All of a sudden, by building these platforms, all, they could see, you know, how much should I be selling this fruit or vegetable for? Whereas before they were being cheated, now all of a sudden their status in life improved because they're making fair share for their hard work. And I think across the board, you're actually seeing the impact. It's actually lifting people out of poverty. Uh, but we need to do a lot more to make sure that we're training and investing in those people. All right. Well, look, we're here. and We've got 20 minutes to run about mastering quality growth, passing the test of technology. The kind of thing you've just said about people generate, generating income, even if they're farmers and fishermen working out where the best price is in the market, think towards the end of this session about where the next frontier is and the next frontier of challenge, both uh, for positives and negatives. I'll come back to you in a moment. Please. I'm uh, Brian Gallagher, CEO of United Way Worldwide, and this is still in the unintended consequences, but really role of market, role of government, role of media in terms of use or misuse of data. There's a front page story in the China Daily today of a young woman who's been in the media in China for the last three months. She posted on her Facebook that she was an executive with the Red Cross of the China Association Red Cross, filmed with her luxury sports car. She got pummeled by the Chinese um, bloggers. It was a media frenzy for the Chinese media. Uh, it wasn't true. Charitable giving dropped 90% month over month after the story happened. And whether it was that kind of data, she, she was wrong, obviously. But what role does the marketplace and normative behavior change versus government versus media play in calibrating the productive use of all of this data or misuse of the data? Tiger. <laughs> I, I'd go back to what Nathan said on newspapers. I think it was a great, a great example. So there are censorships that you could have for newspapers. Just going back to that one. Uh, you could have censorship that is at that extreme or you could have censorship at a much lower level which just becomes a libel or a, or a, or a suit in court. You probably have to end up with some regulation, but I would argue that the more regulation you have, the more you're going to have someone who breaks the regulation, the more you're going to have no progress. I think one of the mistakes we should not make is assuming that we can't get to the other end, to Matthew's point, and two, we also need to tell people that it's, there's going to be pain in the short term. What about that question though about normative behavior? Will normative behavior survive? And I'm, I'm reinterpreting the question pretty crudely there. Well, I, I think uh, the, the deeper question is where does the power reside? What's scarier is that uh, you know, if that individual made a choice, a decision, right, uh, that's one thing versus if somebody else released that data for them. My view is that we need to make sure that the power is shifted to the individual, that it's not the government necessarily making the decision or private sector companies. There are a lot of companies you may sign up for and you have no idea two days later how they're going to use that data. That to me is one of the scariest things that's happening in that space. So my solution would be to make sure that we're shifting the power to the end user so the person, the individual is making that decision, especially in an era where we're leaving digital footprints and we have no idea where those digital footprints are going to end up 20 years from now. Jennifer. Uh, the reflection I have 
goes back to the values of those individuals and how they interact with one another um, and just the concern around uh, what are the ethics if there is someone being attacked essentially on their digital profile, if there's a cyber attack, is, is it based on something that is true or that's not true and how do you actually have a dialogue with people uh, because you can't necessarily respond by just shutting everything down um, but also if you can't engage in a meaningful dialogue with people that are just attacking someone um, and who knows what their motives are, I think that's what puts us into a difficult, difficult position. And there's uh, okay, do you want to come in? I think you're going to speak in Chinese so you, everyone will need a headset please. Uh, just one moment. Uh, you wanted to come in. Who wanted to come in? Oh, I, I was just going to say there's also a real asymmetry that's going on here where you have individuals that can broadcast information more quickly than, than the Red Cross or a, or a government or a corporate in, entity. And so that asymmetry will correct itself eventually, but again, there's a, there's a bumpy time. That How we will have it correct ahead. itself? Well, I, I think that you're watching as people are getting much more comfortable, even as, as corporate entities, disclosing information on Twitter in real time as it happens, but it's changing the rules of the game. So you, if you misstep or you do something wrong, the expectation of the crowd is that you will disclose it and you'll be very transparent. That's not the old rule. The old rule was cover it up, don't say anything, you know, figure it out after the fact. That's changed and I think it's going to take a while for big you know, governments and corporate entities to adjust to, to how that, that rule works. Okay. Uh, My name is Yu Nai Bo. I'm from uh, Hangzhou, Zhejiang, China. My company is in the uh, education business. My question is large companies usually um, occupy a big share of the market. That means they usually have the largest source of information on the market. So what if large companies do nothing about the information or they do little with the information or do something wrong with the information while the little small play, uh, players can do nothing about it, will that impede the development of the market? So my question is whether those large companies uh, should um, make the core data available to the entire market. in this new technological leap. Jennifer. Well, my reflection on that relates to what a large company is accountable for in the idea of quality growth. Because when I think about quality growth, it's not just about profit, but also about you know, human happiness and health, um, gender equity, environmental sustainability, uh, these types of ideas. So if the data, the use of data should not just be utilized for the purpose of profit, but also for the purpose of bettering people. Uh, so that's the responsibility I see. You know, uh, coming from Silicon Valley, you know, there's a view of large companies that I think is maybe different from the view of large companies in, in a lot of other parts of the world. I, I find large companies to be very slow moving. Um, they're not very nimble. Uh, it's very difficult for them to innovate and frequently they get outflanked by new technologies. So uh, in, in particular, you're talking about you know, release of data. A lot of large companies aren't even able to generate the data that they might misuse faster than a, an innovative company. So uh, you know, uh, my view is that large companies, uh, they serve a useful purpose. They're good to partner with. They have a lot of money. They have market access. Um, but there are a lot of limitations uh, to large companies uh, in, in, a, in a free market. No, I, I just second that in a huge way. We see in industry after industry new companies with new business models that are set up to gather data and use the data much better than the big competitors they compete with and they take the market. Uh, they're just more intelligent on day one. They're structured to be more intelligent on day one. So I, I think that uh, actually the largest companies um, in the space are by far the most innovative and what I mean by that is uh, from a technical perspective what they've done is they've moved towards an open API model and actually built a developer ecosystem where third parties can build off of their platforms. So they're doing really, really well actually uh, because they've taken a platform approach. Those companies whose business models are built around closing off data are, are actually the losers of the century. They're not doing that well. But uh, it does open up a question around uh, the, the personal choices of individuals. Whereas you sign up for some of these services, who's deciding what's done with that data? Well, and, and it's not, it's not 
true in, in every case that even the big companies. I mean, Cloudflare was founded out of the frustration that we were trying to accumulate um, security data from Yahoo and Google and, and companies. And you go to Google and say, you know, tell us all of the times that you've been attacked so that we can help protect the rest of the internet, and they'll tell you to get lost. Um, and so the idea was, could you use security data, gather it together? So I, I think that there's an opportunity to look at those places where big companies aren't sharing data and then find ways to collect smaller companies together to effectively form uh, a co-op of data and that that's a great way to then disrupt uh, those bigger companies. I just want to echo that point, which is I do think it's one of these issues of how do we, how do we create environments that facilitate sharing? Because clearly there's huge value added for individuals, for corporations, for governments. The more data that's shared, probably the better it is. And the problem is getting over that, that initial reluctance to share data. And I think some of the role of perhaps creative regulation and some of the role that will be out there for innovative systems will be to create platforms with which we can share data more effectively. And if you think about that, some of, the, some of the corporations we think about actually, in fact, are doing that. If you think about something like eBay, part of what eBay is doing is encouraging people to share things that they have. Like, basically, you create a repository of what are the items in my life that I might be willing to share with you or exchange with you for something. You know, and I think some of these creative mechanisms are going to allow people, people will find huge value in sharing. Uh, it's just about creating the system that will let them do it. We've got about eight minutes to run. Let me offer you a couple of uh, tweets here. Well, one from Twitter. What's your opinion? Can science keep up with technology? And secondly, how can technology promote fairness and justice, not just growth? I think it's up to people to use technology to promote fairness and, and justice. And I think that also there can be systems that can be created to hold governments or companies accountable. You know, people can launch an audit of, of how their governments are living up to certain commitments. Um, so I think, I think part of it is technology. Um, but unless the institutions with the resources apply that towards fairness and justice, it'll be very difficult because it'll be those with little resources trying to create justice for all. So we need commitment across institutions. Vivek, given what you're now doing at Harvard and have been doing, are there metrics? for measuring fairness and justice? Well, that's a really, really difficult question. That's why I asked it. It's, uh, it's very relative depending on where you're asking that question. Um, but uh, in terms of uh, the, the role of technology, for example, um, I think part of a huge opportunity that I see before us is uh, in terms of uh, actually being able to fight corruption around the world in terms of being able to shine light on the resources that we've already are bringing to bear on problems that we face as a society, whether it's around education, whether it's around health care, um, or the economy in terms of creating jobs. Because a lot of the money, it's, in many cases, it's not a money question. It's just the money is going in the hands of the wrong people. And the ability to basically just shine light and figure out where is that money going, who got it, what did it produce for us, can have a huge impact on making sure that we're creating a more equitable society. Matthew, given that you're on the board of advisors for the Center for Information Technology and Privacy Law, what's your answer to the issue of fairness and justice? I, I, boy, <laughs> I, was, I was feeling good that Vivek got the question. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, think that it, I think it is right that technology is a tool and it can be used for things that are highly unjust and it can be used for things that are that are highly just and i think that the challenge that we have as as um, you know the leaders that are in this room the government organizations that are represented in this room is how do we make sure that again that technology is benefiting everyone and is is continuing to move things forward and that you're not uh, that you're not creating um, challenges that 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 aren't worth the co the the cost that we're giving up um, as a result of them. So, I, I think that's something that we just have to keep evaluating. But technology isn't in and of itself good or bad. It can be used for either of those things um, as we go forward. And that other question, quickly: Can science keep up with technology? That's a tough one. Another tough question. Yeah, I, I mean. Basically, there's this wonderful dance that occurs between technology and science. I mean, for me as a scientist, when there's new technology out there, it just opens up new niches where you can explore and, and find things. I mean, for me, I think one of the interesting spaces is going to be sequence data. I think we're going to have tremendous amounts of sequence. What sequ is that? Uh, sorry, genetic sequence data. 
Okay. Okay. So we're going from a situation now where it's and it's been referred to before during this this uh, dialogue is it's going to be cheaper and cheaper to figure out the genetic information in our bodies from moment to moment in the water that we drink on our skin and we're, there are these vast and complicated communities out there. The technology is going to allow us to house that data so that the scientists can then interrogate the data sets and try to figure out the patterns which are really helping to dictate the things. So I, I do think that th I think the technology is just going to open up a space for science and it will ultimately emerge there. But I, I actually think they play on each other. So if technology does take the lead, which it sometimes does, it actually pulls science forward because technology creates demand on science. It produces an economic reason for science investments to happen. Science will go forward, which then technology leverages. So I think the, the more one goes forward and the more differentiation that's created, the other gets pulled forward. And I, I'll just reemphasize, let's, let's always keep in mind someone will always find a way to misuse it. Hmm. And that's just a fact of life. But and it's you not. Can't, it's you can't mitigate against it. Well, y you have to. Y you try and see. You try and see down the field and see what someone might do. But at the end of the day, someone will always misuse technology, and we just have to do our best to be prepared for that. But but I think one thing to point out is that there's nothing new about that, right? That's no. always been the case with technology since you know since 10,000 years ago when we started playing around with it. Okay, uh, final question to you all. I gave you 90 seconds at the beginning. You get 45 seconds this time. The takeaway that um, uh, you will have from this, particularly on technology, both of what you did here, but also what may have been missing when it comes to how technology can generate growth. Matthew. I, I think the most inspiring panel that I was a part of was uh, earlier today, actually. It was a group of about 50 young Chinese entrepreneurs there. Um, there were about they were there and they were all starting companies and you know what was inspiring to me was I'd done a panel like this again in China about three years ago and the reason why entrepreneurs said that they wanted to start companies was because they said that it would make them rich the reason the entrepreneurs today said that they wanted to start companies is because they said that they wanted to change the world and there is no force that we have that is more powerful than entrepreneurship at solving the world's problems. And the fact that, the, that these Chinese entrepreneurs were saying that that was what they wanted to do was, was really inspiring to me. Vivek. So I was on, um, in this one panel which I thought was really interesting and it was about the global economy and uh, all the challenges that we're facing right now, the economic crisis that countries around the world are going through. Um, but what's really interesting is how interconnected we are uh, at the same time how countries are trying to disconnect in some ways. Uh, so what that led me to think about is the role that technology can play and is playing today when it comes to the global economy. Building up on the entrepreneurship side, there hasn't been a better time than now to be an entrepreneur. If you think about how whether it's somebody sitting here in Dalian or they're sitting in Washington or San Francisco, the ability to use these platforms that have been built and fundamentally change the way the world works that wasn't structurally possible before. Harrison. Uh, I'm in a very high growth company and I tend to spend a lot of time uh, thinking about what our biotechnology can do and I don't spend a lot of time thinking about things like social media. Uh, and w what I gathered from being in a much more general environment and hearing about social media and software and IT and all the things that are happening made me realize how much of the growth that I'm part of is actually driven by these other things. We do executive team meetings every week. People are on four continents when we have them. We promote our products with social media. We benefit from the Human Genome Project. None of that was intended specifically to help us do what we do, and yet we're a very, very high growth company and we benefit from all types of technology, not, not just our particular niche that we're really well known for. Tiger. You know, we are, in a, we are in a company which serves a large part of the corporate world with services. And for us, searching for the next innovation that we can bring back to our client base is, uh, is our business model. You know, one of the big learnings was you must throw your net really wide these days to gather that innovation. It could be happening in a part of the world that actually you don't spend enough time in. And the other one was get closer to your customer because the chances are you're going to co-innovate with them much better. And breakthrough innovations happen when that happens. Nathan. So I, uh, within the last couple of years, I took a, a bit of time off of uh, teaching and, and running my business to write a book which is coming out. And, and one of the, the basic things that I found so interesting is I was interested in this question of why do we experience so many pandemics right now? Why are we experiencing this? And the answer to it 
And the answer to, to really the, the, much of the history of the problem was connectivity between humans, connectivity between animals. And what sort of emerged was this really interesting sort of uh, race between different kinds of connectivity. So this, we are in a world where we can move much more quickly, goods, people, animals, all these things, everywhere around the world. If you look at a map of sort of flight patterns, and you look at a map of flight patterns 10 years ago, you're looking at something, even 10 years ago, is pretty minimal. Now you see this plate of spaghetti. We're really sort of one massive metapopulation. And the real question is, will this sort of electronic and digital connectivity allow us to keep up with the threats that we face based on the sort of physical and transport connectivity? Um, and I'm, 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 I will tell you sort of the, the end of the book, which is I'm, I'm, I'm bullish. I do think that technology is going to get there and allow us to address this. But, um, you know, it's, I mean, in some ways, I think we can just all be uh, sort of amazed to live at this moment of history where we can experience sort of these sorts of things and change can happen at this speed. I hope it's uncooked spaghetti in a straight line, not, <laughs> not cooked and uh, wavy. Jennifer. Uh, the issue that stood out for me and uh, also that I think even requires more attention is the intergenerational power conflict. So even if you reflect on the Arab Spring and how young people are able to use technology to sort of have a certain level of voice, um, they're not really integrated with the established leadership. And so um, the existing established institutions need to learn how to engage youth meaningfully, otherwise the gap between generations will grow and we face a serious crisis. And the one thing I also want to commend is the World Economic Forum for this week launching a new community for young people in their 20s. It's called the Global Shapers Community. It was just announced this week and I think it really will help to set an example for the world on how established institutions can engage with young people. Jennifer, thank you and thank you to you all. I've just had one other tweet. Technology has made it possible for everyone on earth to live a dream. Hard work still pays off. Thank you all very much indeed. And let me leave it uh, to Robert Greenhill, the Managing Director of the Forum, to close the meeting. Well, thank you very much, Nick. And thank you all. Over three days, 1,500 leaders from 90 different countries have gotten together to discuss the issues, to develop new ideas, but perhaps even more important, to develop new friendships. So what's come out of all these different conversations? Well, certainly one of the big themes was the focus on the global economic situation, the challenges uh, with the U.S. fiscal situation, the ongoing um, uncertainty in the, in the Eurozone, counterbalanced by the tremendous vitality here in China and other emerging markets. And Premier Wen made it clear that China was prepared to do its part, but actually that the rest of the global family needed to help as well. And in fact, one of the key themes that came out was this need for collaboration across countries, but also in one of the points made here, the collaboration across generations. Because many of the issues in terms of youth unemployment, in terms of pensions, in terms of health care, actually requires inter intergenerational dialogue as well as intercontinental collaboration. Obviously, a second big theme was the whole question of quality growth in all its different ways quality in terms of, yes, profitable, but also making a difference to the employees, to the, to the individuals who consume the product, to the societies that they're part of, actually contributing to a more equitable and just society. And actually, two of the elements that also came in terms of the way to create quality growth was to actually have a quality society, one that provided opportunities of education, where everyone could participate, where everyone could participate at different stages in their career and also a quality society where people could actually each have a fair share of, of the rewards that comes from that. Another element that came up in many of the conversations was, well, quality growth comes from, high quality growth comes from high quality companies. Companies that actually have an ethical frame, that have a leadership that's not corrupt, that actually believes in its core, not just in its CSR programs, to actually make the world a better place, and actually walks the talk from the CEO right down to, to the newest employee. And therefore, one of the themes that came out was, yes, the role of business is business, but the role of business is people. People who are employees, people in society, people who are consumers. And this broader sense of collaboration also came in the third element, which we've seen so clearly here, about the whole role of innovation, technology, entrepreneurship. Because if one of the themes, or sub-themes, of, of this session was 
resource scarcity. The fact that we are, for the indefinite future, going to be in a resource finite world. If resources are finite, innovation and imagination is infinite. And one of the most exciting elements of this fifth annual meeting of the new champions was the extent to which this innovation, these ideas, this entrepreneurship is coming from every corner of the globe. And this whole sense that there's actually this new wave of entrepreneurship and innovation coming from new countries that haven't been involved and new generations was perhaps the most important overarching theme. So in fact, I'd like to finish with what Jennifer just mentioned, the incredibly important symbolic launching of the Global Shapers community, those people in their 20s, to ensure they're fully engaged in this innovation, this entrepreneurship that will help us together deliver quality growth. Now, I mentioned that collaboration and partnership is a core part of what uh, the annual meeting of new champions is all about. And throughout the five years, we've actually had a tremendous collaboration and partnership with Tianjin and with Dalian. And I would like to, on behalf of the forum and all of you, thank the people and the leadership of Dalian for their extraordinary support uh, over this, this, uh, this, uh, this fifth anniversary forum, but also over the year uh, leading up to it. And I'd like to invite the Vice Mayor of Dalian, Sao Aiwa, Vice Mayor of Dalian, to address the podium. Thank you. Distinctive uh, Executive Director, Mr. Robert Greenhill and Ms. Uh, Schwab, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Together with uh, more than 1,700 industrial elites from uh, more than 90 countries, uh, we have been gathering here for three day and nights, days and nights. At the end of uh, the, uh, at the conclusion of this forum, we have uh, reached a consensus. Friendship, confidence, responsibility, and collaboration. These are the uh, spirits of our discussion. So, mastering the quality growth, it is not only the theme of this uh, forum, but also a topic that will never end. And we also see the efforts people have, devo have uh, made to achieve this. And we also see the possibility of translate dream into translate this dream into reality. And five years ago in September, the first Summer Davos Forum came to China, came to Dalian, just like Premier Wen, His Excellency's remark at the opening ceremony. He said, "The Summer Davos Forum has reached a consensus after five years of experience." We're targeting the world, targeting the future, and targeting innovation, and targeting the youth. In the past five years, the World Economic Forum has been developing by itself. Meanwhile, WEF impacted Dalian profoundly. Professor Schwab's uh, comment saying that Dalian, the city, is uh, gradually becoming a very good platform for economic development and international collaboration. As a person who's been here for so many years, I'm convinced that this uh, forum doesn't only last for three days. It connects today's ending point to the next year's uh, beginning point of this forum. And uh, it is not only the participants uh, participating in this forum, it is the whole world that is participating this uh, forum. A topic we're discussing is not only going to impla impact economy and social aspects, it will impact the whole world as well. So I really uh, appreciate WEF's uh, efforts and uh, Professor Schwab's uh, dedication. And I also would like to express my gratitude to our brother city of Tianjin for your support. I also would like to thank all the volunteers for your actions and your behavior. It's a showcase of quality of Dalian, and uh, you have uh, sincerely, passionately expressed 
Dalian people's uh, devotion to this forum. We're very much looking forward to the uh, next gathering of uh, 2013 in Dalian. Thank you. Well, every end is also a beginning, and with the end of the fifth annual meeting of new champions comes the beginning of the preparation for the sixth annual meeting of new champions. And so it's now my great pleasure to ask the Vice Mayor of Tianjin, Ren Shuifeng, to address the, the group. Robert Greenhill, and I respect Ms. Vice Mayor Cao Aihua and Mrs. Schwab. Ladies and gentlemen, at the moment of the summer Taurus 2011 coming to the end, on behalf of Tianjin Municipal Government, I would like to express my sincerest congratulations to this great success. At the op opening plenary, Premier Wen Jiabao delivered a speech with a tr uh, attractive huge attention and became highlight of this annual meeting. The scene, Mustang Quality Growth, uh, helps us studying a new business model, pursuing a new growth energy, shaping future business policy, embrace in innovative and a sustainable growth. Changing uh, delegation headed by the mayor of uh, Huang Jingguo uh, communicates with the public figures, CEOs, media leaders, and all distinguished families members of the forum. We are impressed of the hospitalities of Dalian. Thank you, Dalian, and thank you, uh, West Mayor Cao. As the host city of the 2008 and the 2010 annual meeting of the new champions, we are more involved in a big family as we also always see just the Professor Swab side. We are the people of Dowers. Ladies and gentlemen, the communication will carry on and our friendship will last forever. We sincerely invite you to come together again on the Summer Dowers 2012 in Tianjin. Let's celebrate our friendship and bring our hearts together for a better tomorrow. Welcome and you next year. See you next year in Tianjin. Thank you very much. In closing, I would like to thank, on behalf of, of Klaus Schwab, and the management team, and the entire forum, the people of Dalian for their hospitality and their engagement, and the many volunteers who, who gave so generously of their time and their, uh, their enthusiasms of the last few days. I would like to also thank the, the staff of the World Economic Forum and Jeremy Jurgens, who, for the fifth year, has been organizing this on our behalf. And most of all, we'd like to thank you because it is really the engagement of the participations that makes it such a special event. And finally, it's my pleasure to invite you to join us downstairs for, for a final uh, reception and, and cocktail, and to say we look forward to seeing you all next year in Tianjin. Xie xie.